Uh, thank you, Evo, and just uh, saying thanks to all of Perspectiva for having me on today and, and leading the conversation here. I'm uh, deeply honored and quite excited to be engaging with so many new new faces and new names. Um, yeah, I mean, how do we do justice to Gepser's work in a, in a single seminar? It's, it's a little bit difficult, but we're going to try. Um, let me get my screen open here. All right. So I have a few, just a few slides for us to help us along the way here. And I was thinking about how exactly I would frame this, this conversation. And I came up with at least three points that we're going to be trying to tackle today. Uh, three theses. One is we can't talk about what we're calling the meta crisis today without talking about a new consciousness of time. The way we think, the way we perceive, the way we relate to time is critical to understanding the problems that are at hand and their complexity, not just in a conceptual sense, but in a lived sense, a perceptual sense, and in an imaginative sense. Uh, so what is our task? Well, I'm framing it as this, that we need a time beyond progress. And in order to do this, a back leap from the future is in order. And we'll get into that a little bit, perhaps towards the end of this session and then um, in, in the following sessions, what that might actually mean. Uh, to open up with Gepser as well, uh, I think would be good if I can move the slide. Here we go. So this is how Gepser frames it. And we're going to return to this and sort of unpack this statement that Gepser gives us. Uh, he says, the eruption of time into our consciousness this is the profound and unique event of our historical moment. It presents us with a new theme and a new task, and its realization, which comes about through us, is attended by a wholly new reality of the world, a new intensity and a freer awareness. Every one of us today in his or her own way, wherever we may be, is not only a witness, but an instrument of what is to be reality. Hence, for us to create the means with which we ourselves can jointly shape this new reality. And I like this statement because it's really um, inviting us to lean in here. This is not just a conceptual problem. This is a problem that we live. This is a trouble or a question that we are um, being lived by in our present moment. So let me just see if I can, yeah, there we go. Um, who was Gepser, first of all? Uh, some of you may be already familiar with his work. He's one of these interesting mid-century thinkers, a, a Swiss poet, a philosopher, a phenomenologist of consciousness. Uh, and again, one of these sweeping mid-century thinkers who wrote a lot about this history of consciousness, uh, one of many, uh, but uh, I think anyway, unique for his insights into time. Uh, Gebser was seeing a dramatic transformation undergo in Europe, uh, transformations of myth and poetry. And he used to draw these connections between what he saw between art and science, myth and poetry, and trace a kind of evolution of consciousness, a, a dynamic unfolding of what he called the structures of consciousness across the history of consciousness, from the archaic to the magic, to the mythic, to the mental. And some of you who've read Ken Wilber's work might be familiar with some of this terminology. If not, that's quite all right. We're gonna to be touching into each of these for a few minutes as we get started here. Uh, but this is sort of a, a dynamic unfolding. Each of these structures were mutations. They would be complex and dramatic reorganizations of human identity. They would be individual and collective, and they would also be perceptual relationships, new perceptual relationships, different forms of relation with space and time. Uh, now, I have just a quick list here for us because we've only got a few minutes to really touch into them or each of them. And the archaic structure for Gebser is probably the most difficult to really get a sense of. Uh, but George Feuerstein describes it as a kind of maximum latency, uh, a maximum latency of our own consciousness and a continuity of identity between the self and the world. And we can't point to a specific epoch in material history and say, there it is, there's the archaic structure. It's rather a kind of vanishing point on the horizon of our knowability, right? A zero point from which everything else unfolds. So we can kind of hold it lightly there. But the magic we can talk a little bit more about, and you know, if you read Gepsi, you really get a lived sense of what this could be like. Uh, 
I mean, one of the things maybe we should mention also at the outset here is that the structures for Gepser are not, we see them in a kind of sequence here, but when we actually talk about them and investigate them in our own history, they're always co-present in a dynamic relationship with us in the present. The only way to be present for Gepser, to be here, is to have all of these structures co-present in some kind of dynamic interrelatedness. So just kind of keep that in mind as well. But we can also talk about a kind of historical context as well, right? That the magic structure Gepser would associate with this sort of unthinkably expansive, nearly timeless passage of millennia in the Paleolithic uh, or of Paleolithic cultures, right? And for Gepser, he spends a lot of time here really leaning into the po possible understanding of their sensorium, what their structure of feeling might have been like, right? Um, it had something to do for Gepser with listening. Uh, you know, from the carved statuettes of faces without mouths, uh, he would suggest, as Marshall McLuhan would also do so later on in a few decades, that uh, these would emphasize in a kind of an acoustic relationship with the world, the, the acoustics of the cave with an emphasis on auditory hearing and auditory cultures, right? The cave in this structure of consciousness is an image of the world enveloped, it's vibratory, it's participatory. When we hear a sound or we sound into the cave, we sound into the world and the world echoes back. So there's a much more dynamic and relational experience here that he's speaking to. Um, you know, if the magic structure was associated with this sort of timelessness of now and the auditory senses, then for Gepser, the mythic structure would be something like the stirring of soul and the emergence of rhythmic time. You can think of the, uh, the lunar and the astronomical calendars of the upper Paleolithic for sure, uh, but you can also think about the very sophisticated astronomies and cosmologies of everything from Neolithic Stonehenge to uh, ancient Egyptians uh, to the Meso Mesoamerican peoples and their very complex calendrical systems, right? Time for these peoples becomes a kind of qualitative dimension a cosmological tapestry of significance where appearances corresponded with one another. They found themselves in relation with us and us with the world and what we would probably today call a sort of archetypal meaning. And as you see, we're kind of sweeping through these and, and usually there's a bit more time to really touch base into each of them, but I'm hoping you're getting a sense that all of them have, uh, at least in Gepser's work, a rich cultural study to try to bring them to life. Uh, so the magic, the mythic structure has this kind of rhythmicity, right? This sort of cyclical rhythmicity or, or spiral of the seasons, the in-breath and the out-breath, the complementarity of inside and outside, sound and silence, um, life and death, right? Uh, complementarity is a big emphasis in the mythic structure. But as we move briefly into the mental structure, we begin to kind of find a, a familiarity with it, right? And, and a likeness with our own contemporary world. Uh, this is where thinking begins to distinguish itself from the auditory world as cave. And it opens up into a new self where we stand apart and we are able to finally say I or I am. Charles Taylor has a helpful word for this new self uh, in the context of European history, at least. He calls it the buffered self. There's a kind of insulation or layering that we, we finally begin to have with the, the perceptual world in a way that we didn't rely upon in the magic structure or the mythic structure. Uh, the self whose agency is protected, or we might say, as, as Shakespeare uh, describes, ensconced, right? Apart from the teeming forces of an enchanted reality. Thinking becomes continuous with being. We move from the uh, rhythmic enmeshment of a participatory cosmos into a more discerning consciousness of ego, where the thinking mind is a tool we use to divide the world into all matter of oppositions and binaries. We stand apart. We cut into the present with the knife of thought. And with the mental structure comes this capacity for sense-directed thinking, right? Is this new, this new capacity which begins to emerge in us. Time the divider in this sense. Time as arrow, which moves in, at least in the European context, from left to right. With the mental structure, however, this, the primary realization of this achievement is a kind of spatial consciousness, a three-dimensional realization of space. If the mythic structure is this rhythmic, relational, psychic-oriented or psyche-oriented um, world, then the mental structure is really kind of leaning into this waking consciousness, which spatializes time and space itself, right? It's that 
line from Galileo, uh, the particularly famous one, to measure everything measurable and to make everything measurable that is not yet measurable, right? This way of thinking and perceiving is both a kind of excellence, right? There's a capacity that we all celebrate today. Uh, and we're, we're, we, we are taught to celebrate, we're enculturated to celebrate, but also there's a limitation to this mental structure. Uh, when we measure, measure and we spatialize, this helps us begin to approach our own time and what we're calling this, this age of eruption. Uh, and so what are we talking about when we're talking about an age of eruption? Well, uh, hopefully, you know, answering this, we're not going to necessarily foreclose anything or, or develop a kind of conceptual closer, closure, but rather I'm hoping that we're going to be setting up the appropriate openings, the right sort of questions that permit us to stay with the trouble, as Donna Haraway talks about, uh, and in a sense, live with this trouble enough to help us meet the unthinkable present, as William Gibson calls, which is at hand. And what is this unthinkable present, right? We've mentioned a few of these structures of consciousness. We haven't mentioned the integral structure yet. Well, Gebser saw his own time and our time as a, as a time of transition, um, a, transi a transition or an interim world between worlds. And we're seeking to understand ourselves and our context, uh, to turn this dispassionate gaze of, towards the past eras, which often conveniently confirm our narrative of the present back on ourselves. What do we make of the strange case of the moderns as Bruno Latour would talk about? Well, Charles Taylor has another helpful way of thinking about this and he calls it the, the unacknowledged, unacknowledged shape of the background or as Heidegger would put it, the pre-ontology. What's useful about this concept, and I think it relates very much to Gebser's work, this unacknowledged sense or shape of the background, is it points to a structure of feeling, a sensefulness that we all already engage in in the present, a kind of ambient mood or a background track that's always playing that sort of fills or suffuses our social imaginary. So when we're talking about these structures of consciousness, particularly about this age of eruption and this time between worlds, how do we lean into that right now? It's a helpful way for us to get a sense of what Gebser was pointing to, a shift of worldview and time, uh, time and space, world and self, language and myth, metaphor, our dynamic relational posture with the world is changing. It's no longer working, but we're also being changed. We're being acted upon. And in this unbearable friction of the present, we are also beginning to become something else. So how do we turn our attention to this? Uh, to these subtle reworkings and reorganizations of meaning and matter? How do we begin to participate as active co-agents in this meaning mattering? Um, so for Gebser, we live in this interim world. And Gebser echoes Gramsci when he writes about this, that we live in a kind of Janus-faced world. I think I have a slide here just for the fun of it. Yeah, here we go. Okay. We live in a Janus face world. Um, and it's worth at least quoting him a little bit at like to, to, to get a feel of what he was talking about here. Um, he writes that, you know, we live in a Janus face world. On the one hand, we are bound to the consciousness structure in force until now, which to the extent that it is deficient is now threatening to collapse. And yet, as Gebser points out, there is a solution in this dissolution, as he writes that we are already indebted to the new yet only gradually emerging consciousness structure, which is in the process of formation. As a consequence, a certain confusion comes to the fore because the weakened foundations of the old manner of thinking are not yet sufficiently counterbalanced by the consolidation of the new mode of perception. And really this month at, at Perspectiva, I think we're going to be leaning into what it means to consolidate the new mode of perception that Gebs are speaking about. And some of you may be familiar already with uh, Antonio Gramsci's quote, right? And the new is struggling to be born while the old remains in power in our interregnum, right? And as a result, all sorts of monsters are born forth. Uh, I wrote about this in my book, and I think Katsuhiro Otomo's 1988 film, for those of you who are film buffs, um, is a really excellent uh, sort of in cinematic illustration of this interim world, uh, this kind of dynamic myth uh, or, or, or storytelling for the integral mutation. So it's just an aside. Now, Gebser goes on to explain or describe our kind of historical situation 
uh, where he's talking about, you know, the world of our fathers, we might say contemporaneously, uh, the world of our ancestors, the moderns. We're living in a spatially frozen world, he says, and they consider the world to be, dis uh, they consider the temporal world to be a disturbing factor. Uh, it was nothing but a system of measurements or relationships between moments. Time as quality or intensity was simply not taken into account. And this is very true. And I think Latour helps us with a fun image as well here. You can see this um, illustration. Uh, uh, he, he mentions this in an excellent lecture that's available on YouTube called uh, Reset Modernity. Uh, in this lecture, he's talking about the strange spatialization of the world by the moderns, right? This orientation towards space or the sort of static space that Gebser's talking about. And he says, well, you know, it's very strange what the moderns said, this invention of the gaze. Uh, he says, the gaze is very strange. This is Latour. We forget, uh, what we forget is that the object's role to, uh, being given here is to be stopped in the middle of its own trajectory or being looked at by a very strange and limited gaze, this eyeball on a tripod, tripod that's sort of staring at the world in that subject-object relationship. He says, the Western gaze is one eye fixed at a distance. Objects are not in the world that way. It's very strange. Um, so we can kind of get a, get a sense. This is very much what Gebser's also doing. He's allowing us to sort of turn our attention back on our the way we construct our own consciousness, our own awareness of space. And Gebser's challenging this. He's saying, you know, this way of engaging with the world and arresting the world as frozen objects, where time is just a kind of measurement of the clock, doesn't suffice for the complexity, the dynamism, the aliveness, the interrelationship of things, right? It cuts the world into little bits. And this creates a kind of push-pull dynamic, which amounts to a crisis for Gebser. You know, Gebser wrote that, uh, you know, perspective, right? This is what we call perspective in any art class. It fixes the observer as well as the observed. Uh, it fixes man on the one hand or humanity on the one hand and the world on the other. Uh, you know, it's an unusual image here, kind of striking an uncanny one, but yet it is an image of ourselves, right? Um, and it's perhaps even more strange that our surveillance, surveillance society has become so utterly accustomed to this, uh, from the gaze of our cell phone cameras to our satellites, right? This perspectival gaze has transformed uh, from its inception as, as a kind of world ordering to something today that we're a lot more familiar with as a kind of crisis of perspective and a lack of groundedness is a strange way in which this kind of fragmentation of the self from the world has become a sort of flood where everybody's able to have their kind of post-truth encapsulation, right? Breaking off into their own um, hyper realities, hyper perspectival realities. Uh, you know, Gebser points this out that this sort of orientation to the world has both an excellence, but also a limitation. And eventually that limitation would start to overcome us. He writes that these developments are the conclusion of a process in our day that was already prefigured as a negative possibility, the very beginnings of the mental structure of consciousness. Um, so here we are uh, in uh, this kind of crisis of the moderns. Um, but what is time for Gebser? Well, he writes that, you know, the fact that complex time, right, which is time as it actually is, much more dynamic, more lived intensity, um, the fact that it was an encompassing and co-constituting aspect of the world has been ignored for centuries, even excluded from knowledge, or at best, falsely spatialized. It's left us unprepared to cope with modern knowledge when modern knowledge thrusts it in our attention and it remains suppressed like a force. Like any suppressed or repressed force, he writes, when first released, it overpowers, it frightens, and continues to confuse us in a destructive manner. Now, I think the next image, yes, yeah, so here's just the quote again, right? Uh, as he's saying here, that this temporal world was a disturbing factor for the moderns. It kept showing up, and it kept showing up in deeply unnerving kinds of ways. If we think in the, you know, the 19th and 20th centuries, even the the, the mere awareness that Earth is millions upon billions of years old um, was became the subject of a sort of science fiction horror. A lot of early sci-fi horror in the in the 20th century was kind of using that as a trope. This sense of uh, the world being much more vast and ancient and unstable and less friendly to the human than we imagined. There was a kind of temporal anxiety that began to emerge here. As Gebser says, you know, time as a quality or an intensity was simply not taken into account. Um, you know, McLuhan also, uh, is also present here in a lot of ways where uh, 
where Gebser, and this is Gebser writing in 1949, 1950, right? Decades before McLuhan would end up writing, uh, uh, you know, his work on media and communication medium and how that was transforming the world. But, uh, you know, here is Gebser kind of foreshadowing McLuhan saying that technology outdoes itself from year to year in shrinking space by mastering time and can temporally condensing great distances. And he uses a uh, supersonic aircraft and the radio and the television as these examples. Uh, McLuhan would probably call it more of an electric technology or electric media. But he says, we are confronted here with the eruption of the fourth dimension into the three-dimensional world, which in its first outburst shatters this three-dimensional world. Uh, on, at first, the unmastered time threatens to destroy space and its framework. And often with my students, I bring up the Italian futurists in the early 1910s, 1920s, because of their striking, uh, A, their... their, their um, their love uh, and association with technology and nationalism, which I think is no, no mistake there, but also the, the, the dynamism that they're attempting to express here. And Gebser points out that really it was in the 20th century that this eruption of time really begins to uh, develop a kind of momentum. That if in the early years of modernity, we were attempting to realize and to spatialize the world, the new consciousness pressing upon us in the 20th century was this new consciousness of time, the reality of time, its dynamism, its aliveness. Philosophers like Bergson and Whitehead were also sort of tackling this and physics was coming up with all sorts of new paradigms. Um, but I think we can kind of get a more concrete sense of it with dynamic images like this. This is uh, supposed to be a knight on a horse, right? But there's an implication of this movement and dynamism that artists are attempting to render in into creative expression. And I think that might sum up exactly what we're also working to look, uh, working to do here. How do we creatively express this new dynamic expression or realization of time? Um, but for Gebser, time isn't just things speeding up. Think time isn't just um, an overwhelming relational complexity. For Gebser, time is present, as he says here. Uh, he says, rather, it is a question of what is future in us, that is, what is present to the same degree that all past in us is present. So what are we getting all at here, right? Uh, I think we're kind of, I know we don't have too much time, but I'm trying to lead us a little bit closer and closer to the present, where we can touch with, uh, touch in with the felt sense that we're all experiencing here, particularly with um, uh, the climate crisis, right? I know recently there have been uh, quite a few uh, historical events happening just between Israel and Palestine. It's deeply tragic. And I'm reminded, I was reminded this morning reviewing my notes for this session uh, uh, of some writing that I've been working on that's going to be in a forthcoming uh, journal called, called Mutations, uh, where I was attempting to kind of describe or articulate this felt sense of the intensification of time, of time sort of breaking forth. And really it was during the pandemic, I think that we all began to feel it. So maybe I'll just read a paragraph or so of this, um, which is sort of an introduction to the essay that sort of captures the spirit of time in our time. Let me get this open for us. Yeah. So as I write this, uh, lately time has felt more like a broken rhythm. Clock time was already wavering, a thin trance waiting to be liberated from the speed of capital. In its place, time has become a strange pluralism. It rushes forward and stands still. Time is the heaviness we feel about uncertain climate futures and the weightless flurry of all our transient nows. Time shows up as the rote pulse of calendar app notifications, now robbed of any sense of urgency during the blurry weeks of COVID lockdown, but we all feel that a different order of time has come alive in its place. A torrent, dramatic and full, roaring with the import of historical, political and planetary events. Mutations of language concerning this emergent consciousness of time have proliferated. With new temporal sensibilities come new senses of world, self, and being, and so there are the great lists of proclaimed epochs attempting to name the when and the where of our arrival. Anthropocene, Cthulhu scene, right from Donna Haraway, Capitalocene, really a history with a thousand names, the infinity of the Anthropocene. And so this present array of epoch naming 
at least I'm arguing here, it speaks to a certain kind of recognition that there is a new structure of feeling showing up in public conversations. Uh, we no longer ask how is the weather without that kind of feeling pervading the space between the words. Time is making an appearance in these interstices. Uh, it's a subtle recognition, a certain kind of anxiousness or even a sense of guilt, right? And this is what I write, that although we are already living in a new time, demanding a new worldview, we do not know how to address this remarkable new realism. So this is what we're kind of getting at here. Um, I wanna also point out the, the French word for time. This is something that Andreas Malm points out in the book, his book, uh, The Progress of the Storm. The French word for time is temps, right? But temps also means weather. And I think this is a good word that's drawing us back into what it means that time as an intensity is pressing forward for a kind of cultural realization, right? A kind of spiritual realization in us. Uh, this is not the time of calendars and clocks, but it is a time of relationships and strange and weird constellations of past futures. Um, you know, for instance, Andreas Malm in his book writes about this when he talks about, uh, I'll just quote him, you know, he says, uh, the, the excess of heat in the earth system is the sum, and he's talking about global warming, right, is the sum of all of those historical fires, the storm of climate change that draws its force from countless acts of combustion. And he's talking about the sense that, you know, the, the storms that we encounter today are the activity of our own ancestors from 100 and 150, 200 years ago, they are in a strange and weird way, very, very present right now in, in the floods and hurricanes in particular um, uh, climatological disruptions that we're experiencing in a very material way right now, but they're also present. Um, and he says, and he concludes here, we can never be in the heat of the moment, only in the heat of this ongoing past indeed the air is heavy with time. This felt sense, the structure of feeling today that the air has become heavy with time is exactly what I'm pointing to. Um, you know, in, in other writing, I talk about this idea that, um, and this is something I think Gepser brings up quite a bit in his work as well, that you know, the way we experience a new mutation, and in this context, we're talking about what he called the integral mutation. We experience it first as a kind of negative, a kind of negative image of what is potentially a constructive emergence, a new way of relating with the world. Well, I think with the climate crisis, we can definitely experience this new way of relating with the world as a kind of negative image of an integral time, an integrative and complex time where the past and the future are in relationship with us in a continuity of the present and a lived present. Uh, you know, if we can't just spatialize time uh, as, as we're talking about, and it's more of this complex time, uh, then you know, Gepser was a, at least uh, anticipating the cybernetics of the 1960s and 70s, right? Um, and as he says, you know, the A perspective compared to the perspective of the Renaissance, the A perspectival consciousness is a consciousness of the whole, an integral consciousness encompassing all time and embracing both our distant past and our approaching future as a living present. And he also writes that we are shaped not only by today and yesterday, but by tomorrow as well. So how do we really begin to lift this, I think is, is the question. And But the other flip side of that question is how is this already living us? I think many of us can probably feel into this sense of an intensification of time. For Gepser, I think the good thing here and the sort of optimistic way of viewing all of this is that uh, it's a constructive opening. It is... Uh, as uh, Shreko Horvach talks about, and I can get to the, the last slide for us here, um, is, is the task that also Gepser is speaking about right here, right? And this is Shreko talking about this in the, after the apocalypse. And he says, our Herculean task today is not only to understand the apocalypse, but to imagine a future that comes after the apocalypse. And this can only start once we understand time as the crucial component of any struggle that wants to be successful in this historic task. We need to invent a different temporality. And just to kind of like jump back for a moment and thinking about, uh, you know, what Gepser talked about with the, the stru different structures of consciousness, I can pop this open here. Uh, here we go. I think I'm back. Uh, there's no more slides. Um, we're talking about a new structure of consciousness. We're talking about how do we creatively realize this in our culture, in our social imaginary. I might even uh, call it, I'm playing with this word in, in my new 
writing, a sort of temporal imaginary, right? Or what Bruce Clark calls a planetary imaginary. How do we have this sort of metamorphosis of our social imaginary? And how do we understand and track and trace our own perceptual mutation, right? From the kind of sense-directed thinking of the mental structure that Gebser is speaking about to what Gebser calls a senseful awareing. Our, relation, our dynamic relationship in the present. It requires a, a more senseful experience rather than an abstract one. And this is really talking about a dramatic restructuring of our thinking, uh, a reworking of our metaphors with respect to time and a new and intuitive sense, right? That could be expressed constructively and creatively as a new culture, perhaps a new planetary culture that has a different dynamic relationship with past and future. Uh, to go back to that initial statement where Gebser saying that the eruption of time into our consciousness is the profound and unique event, right? It presents us with a new theme and a new task, as I stated in the beginning. And it's new realization, which comes about through us, is attended wholly by a new reality of the world. This is what we're talking about, a new intensity and a freer awareness. And Gebser's calling us in, and I like, suggest that we this month we see it this way, that we're all being called in. Each one of us today in his or her own way, whether, wherever we may be, is not only a witness, but an instrument. So how do we become an instrument? How do we learn to participate in jointly shaping this new reality? Um, Evo, I don't know if I've gone 30 minutes or, or what, but I think this might be a good time to pause and sort of open it up. There's a lot of material here um, that we could still get into, but perhaps it would be good to sort of lead with some questions. 